By late afternoon, police inquiries lead them to Oswald's co-worker, Buell Frazier, the man who drove him to work that day. Fraser is taken to police headquarters to be questioned by Chief Interrogator Captain Will Fritz. He thought I was guilty, so he had someone type up a statement, and he said, sign this. And this said that I was involved in the um, assassination of President John F. Kennedy. I looked at him and I said, I'm not signing that. I said, that's ridiculous. Well, he drew his hand back to hit me, and I put my arm up like I got the block. And, and he said, he was so mad and he was so red-faced. And I told him, I said, you hit me. I said, there's a policeman outside that door. But I said, we're going to have a hell of a fight before they get in there. So he grabbed the paper and the pen and stomped out. And I never did see him again. But Frazier's interrogations and a lie detector test continue into the night. I welcome this kind of examination. You are free to do as we tell you. You are free to do as we tell you. His hip could be seen to move violently forward. Back and to the left. Back and to the left. That's why I don't read the newspaper. I'm a man. I'm 40. What did the president know and when did he know it? I began by telling the president that there was a cancer growing on the presidency. As of now, I am in control here in the White House. This is crack cocaine from the White House. It could easily have been heroin or PCP. It's as innocent looking as candy. Good evening, this is Mae Bressel in Carmel, California. Anybody who's not willing to change based on what they learn is ignorant. Coffee's for closers only. I think we're, we're giving you enough. Go on to Chicago and let's win there. Keep hope alive! Keep hope alive! Keep hope alive! This is the Midnight Rider News Show with S.T. Patrick. Hi, this is Carmine Savastano, and you're listening to the Midnight Rider News Show with S.T. Patrick. Hello, America and the world. Welcome to the Midnight Rider News Show. This is Rob Clark, your friendly neighborhood guest host, tracing through the trials and travails that have so tempestuously and untruthfully been blasted into your eyes, ears, and minds by the state-sponsored talking heads, court historians, and the textbook conglomerates that control information today. Welcome to the show, folks. Hello, hello. This is not the sultry sound of S.T. Patrick. It is your boy, Rob Clark, from the Lone Gummin Podcast. Once again, back in the new year of 2019, guest hosting for S.T. so he can take a vacation. He is a very hardworking man, recording this show for you, and also getting together a new quarterly magazine called Garrison, which will be coming soon, and working on... The Deep Truth Journal, all of which can be found over at MidnightWriterNews.com. If you like what you hear tonight, let ST know that I did a good job. Uh, drop him a line at MidnightWriterNews at gmail.com. For any comments, show suggestions, guest suggestions, uh, anything of that nature. So let's clean the castle a little bit, as our boy ST likes to say. You know, 2018 has come and gone. We got a lot of new file releases last year. I think we're going to get some more here, hopefully within the next couple months. And then that'll be pretty much it until, what is it, 2037 or 2039? <laughs> hopefully I'll still be around by then to see what uh, the uh, the Warren Commission files have to say. But uh, it's going to be a little bit of a wait. So. Hopefully we'll get there. It's very rare that I get excited to talk about something when it comes to the Kennedy assassination because so many things that you hear could possibly get you excited. And then, you know, that supposition or that piece of evidence gets torn down by 20 other people and it just turns out to not be as important as you thought it was or it just doesn't fit or make sense in any way that you thought it should or could. Tonight, we're going to be talking about absolute truths. And by absolute truths, I mean verifiable testimony, eyewitness testimony, and facts of the case that we just cannot overlook anymore. By the time this show is done tonight, hopefully I will have impressed upon you 
the importance of what I'm going to tell you tonight. Tonight we're going to be talking about a man by the name of Buell Wesley Frazier. And to kick us off, I'm going to have my buddy Dan Rather give you a little bit of a backstory. Dan, take it away, sir. Osby got a lift to the school book depository that Friday morning from co-worker Frazier. Frazier's sister, Mrs. Glennie Mae Randall, lived across the street from the Payne house. Uh, I was preparing lunches for my um, brother uh, there at my sink, and I looked out the window and saw Mr. Uh, Oswald cross the street and come up across my driveway, and he had a brown paper bag in his uh, right hand. It was about 27 inches long. It was made out of a heavy brown paper with um, heavy-looking tape on it. Incidentally, the search of the book depository building made after the assassination failed to turn up any curtain rods, and the furnished room, which Oswald was then occupying, was equipped with curtain rods. So Oswald made an uncharacteristic trip to the Payne home Thursday night, returning to the book depository the morning of the assassination with a heavy-looking package that could pass for curtain rods. Was it the rifle? A difference of about eight inches has made this one of the most contentious points for the critics. Within this package, I have a disassembled Manneker Carcano rifle identical to Oswald's. Before I tell you the dimensions, you might want to try to estimate them, as Mrs. Randall and Wesley Frazier did, from memory. Mrs. Randall variously estimated Oswald's package of curtain rods as 27 or 20 feet long. Her brother, Wesley Frazier, said about two feet, give or take a few inches. As a matter of fact, the disassembled manicure is 34 and 8 tenths inches long. Furthermore, Frazier said Oswald, preceding him into the depository building, carried the curtain rods under his armpit with his hand around the bottom. Now, obviously, you can't carry this package that way. Oswald had gotten out of the car first and was then walking away from Frazier. The commission decided that Frazier easily could have been mistaken about Oswald carrying the package. Now, you can decide whether Frazier, walking some 50 feet behind and in his own words not paying much attention, might have missed the few inches of the narrow end of such a package sticking up past Oswald's shoulder. Thank you, Dan Rather. Now, obviously, this was a puff piece put together by Dan Rather back in the 60s to support the Warren Commission's theory that Lenny Mae Randall and Buell Frazier were simply mistaken about the length of the package. And that, indeed, a broken-down man liquor Carcano could fit into a 35-inch package. And as he said, they were mistaken by about 8 inches. And this has been much bandied about by researchers and historians for many, many, many years, ever since it happened. So, what can we do about it now? Well, we can take a look at the obvious facts first and foremost. First one being that there was no package, no paper bag, found in the school book depository of the dimensions described by Lenny May and Buell Frazier. There was no 2-foot, no 27-inch package found in the school book depository. In fact, while, you know, the uh, provenance of the paper bag may be in question, we no doubt have pictures of the paper bag being taken out of the school book depository. Now, unless in fact you want to, you know, indict that the entire DPD was, you know, in on the gig and, and helped to plant the rifle in the bag and frame Oswald, which there are some people out there who do believe that. I, however, do not. You know, when you're trying to get away with something or, you know, set somebody up, I think the least amount of people in on something as, as possible is a, is, a, is a pretty good idea. Because the chance that you just might have one person who just doesn't agree with the ex ethics or morality of what you're doing could bring your entire story down. And we do not have any DPD officer, no Dallas County Sheriff's officer that has ever come forward and said 
that they were in on planting the paper bag or planting the rifle in the sixth floor of the school book depository. So we can't say that with any kind of authority. Number two, no curtain rods were found in the school book depository. No curtain rods loose or none in a package were found in the school book depository. Period. Um, you know, just did not happen. Now, what we did find in the depository is a Manly Carcano rifle. Um, as I said before, some people can dispute this all day. Oh, well, Roger Craig said it was a Mauser. Uh, and then we switched for a Manly Carcano and on and on and on. You know, but we have the, uh, the footage from the rifle being found that day. To me, it looks like the same rifle. And we're going to go with that because nobody has distinctively and 100% disproved that that was not, in fact, the Manlicker Carcano found on the sixth floor that day that we have footage of. So, so far, just to recap, the facts are we have a Manlicker Carcano found on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository, and we have a 38 inch bag found on the sixth floor of the school book depository and taken into evidence. We have descriptions of the bag that Oswald brought to work as being a brown paper bag shaped like a rifle, as Lenny may put it. It was wider at one end than the other. It was about eight inches wide. Um, and but we have no curtain rods and we have no bag of those dimensions being found anywhere in this book depository. So that's where we are so far. Which leads us to believe that one of these things cannot be true. So now let's look into why possibly Buell Frazier has been lying to us for all these years. And What's important for me to say right now is that I know several people, not a lot, but several, have looked into what I'm about to tell you. And I, before anyone wants to accuse me of trying to steal or bite anybody else's research, I just want to point to your direction, good listeners an article that I wrote five years ago about what we're going to be discussing tonight. And yes, I've done shows on it in the past. Yes, I've written essays about it. Yes, I've included the evidence in the essays that you can go see with your own eyes. And it's important for me to let you know this because, you know, in the recent, within the past few years, several other people have become have come to look into this and, and kind of claim uh, this research as their own. And, you know, without the transcripts provided by Richard Gilbride from the HSCA interviews of several of the school book depository employees, we wouldn't have a lot of this information. So first, let me thank him. Uh, he has been a guest on my show a, a couple times. Um, and the hard work of all the people over at the Reopen Kennedy Case Forum uh, throughout the years. Um, the reason I started looking into this, as a matter of fact, was because of the whole uh, prayer man phenomenon, you know, and and the, and the great work of all the guys over there, um, including Stan Dane, Bart Camp, Mick Purdy, uh, and so on and so forth. So. You know, I stand on their shoulders when it comes to this. Now, where everybody else wants to come in is on them. I just want to let you know that I've been looking into this for five years. And the reason is because of Prayer Man. And if you're not familiar with who Prayer Man is, I urge you to go back and listen to episode number 78 of the Midnight Writer News Show to my buddy Bart Camp and ST talk about that very issue. 
it made me rethink a lot about what was going on in that school depo- school book depository. You know, your reality is formed by your perception. Since we weren't there firsthand, our perceptions are perceived by whoever we hear it from, whoever we hear the information from or read the information from. And we have the voices and the written statements of the few who were there and who can tell us what they saw. We have the perceptions given to us by the Warren Commission, the HSCA, and so on and so forth, various authors throughout the years that have, you know, lended their insight into what in the heck was going on in the school book depository that day. So I'm going to start off by reading you a little bit of my essay that I did five years ago. It's still on the web. You can find it at 22novembernetwork.wordpress.com. And the name of the article is, Excuse Me, Mr. Frazier. So when you get there to 22novembernetwork.wordpress.com, just search for Buell Frazier and the article should pop up. Or just Google it. So you can see with your own two eyes what I'm about to tell you. And you can read for yourself. You know, when I started looking into Buell Frazier and what these guys in the, that worked in the, in the school book depository were saying, it blew down the walls of my perception about Buell Frazier. And he is the single, I believe, most important witness that can tell us whether or not Lee Oswald really brought a rifle to work that day. I mean, it hinges on the whole thing. The whole thing. You know, we've been arguing Oswald's innocence or guilt for 56 years, back and forth. We've been looking at entertaining and interesting characters associated with the assassination for 56 years, treading the water, um, distracted. But let's get back to what we can know and what we can prove. And I believe I'm going to open a window here for you, the listener, tonight to hopefully change your perception of Lee Oswald, change your perception of Buell Frazier, and get us a little closer to the truth. Excuse me, Mr. Frazier, but you still have some very important questions to answer. Questions that weren't asked by the Warren Commission, the HSCA, or by Vincent Bugliosi at the trial of Lee Harvey Oswald, or most recently by the Sixth Floor Museum's oral history. This article might ruffle some feathers in the research community, as Buell Frazier has become somewhat of a sacred cow to a lot of people in the Dallas area and the research community. From everybody that I know that has met Mr. Frazier, they have nothing but good things to say about him, that he's very kind and he's soft-spoken and very willing to, to tell his story. The same story that he's been telling for 56 years, as a matter of fact. Yet I firmly believe that as Mr. Frazier seems like a likable, kind, and gentle soul, he holds a very deep, dark secret close to his heart. I think he's getting closer to telling it, though. He tried to avoid the HSCA investigation like the plague. He has in the past been out of reach of researchers, only coming out to do the occasional media piece roughly every five or ten years to media outlets. This year, of course that was five years ago, he made his way to D.C. to speak at the ARC conference, the AARC conference, and then again with his son in Dallas at the Lancer conference. At 69 years young, again this was five years ago, Buell Frazier could potentially be around for quite a long while yet, which is hard to fathom from someone so tightly tied to this case. He is oft forgotten in the big scheme of things, but was a very important piece of this case. He humanized the crazy lone nut by describing him as a family man who loved his children very much. And I think about this sometime over the years. Maybe maybe I saw a side of Lee Oswald that most of the world never got to see. Because he was always kind and very business-like with me. 
Um, and he would play games out in the front yard there at Miss Payne's house with not only his child, which was about three at that time, and then other children. My little nieces used to play with children in the neighborhood, which was a common thing back then. Uh, and they sometimes would be sitting at the table eating, and they would be talking about some game or something they played up there. With. They called him Mr. Lee. Was, they didn't know his name. It was awful, and neither did I until all this happened. But I think that um, about that sometime, because a lot of things you read about him is what a terrible person he was. Um, there's good in everybody. Sometimes we just have to look further. Now, I played that little snippet where he is describing Lee Oswald and humanizing the crazy loon nut. <laughs> um, but m- mostly for that very wonderful song in the background. Baby, come to me. Okay, sorry, enough of that. I won't sing to you anymore. I won't torture you anymore with my singing. Back to the article. Um... But he also put a package going into the Texas School Book Depository in the hands of Lee Oswald the morning of November 22, 1963. I'm not going to rehash the official story, according to Buell Frazier, as told to the DPD and the Warren Commission. I think we've all heard that before. Okay? The obvious problem with his assertions was that no bag of these dimensions were found in the building, no curtain rods were found in the building, as I've stated. And Oswald, while in custody, while openly admitting to other aspects of his life, what he did and where he went and where he lived, he denied the curtain rod story. And this was the genesis of them going after Frazier. As soon as Oswald said, nope, I don't know what you're talking about. Curtain rods, no way, I brought a lunch. That's when they went after Frazier. Uh... Also problematic of Fraser's package story, of course, is that the rifle in question cannot be broken down enough to fit in a two-foot-long paper bag package. And lastly, longtime TSBD employee Jack Doherty claims to have seen Oswald arrive at work and did not see him carrying any package at all. Either way you take it, Buell's story already has problems. Let's look at some more. Bill Frazier came to Dallas by way of Huntsville, Texas, and something he had brought with him was a British Enfield Model 303 rifle, as he admitted he liked to hunt. Lee Oswald, we know from his brother Robert and friends in Russia, also liked to hunt. So, is it out of the realm of possibility that two young fellas who work together and reside in close proximity to each other, that maybe for some fun, they went to check out a new shooting range that had just opened. I give to you Commission Exhibit 3077. And this is concerning Garland Slack. In an effort to resolve discrepancies in information furnished by Mr. Slack concerning this incident, Mrs. Slack contacted Mr. Slack during the interview And according to Mrs. Slack, Mr. Slack mentioned that Oswald was at the rifle range on November 17, 1963, and that he had been brought there by a man named Frazier from Irving, Texas. Mrs. Slack also stated she felt her husband was confused as to the date when he observed the individual he believed to be Oswald at the range, but he was sincere in the statement he had previously made to agents of the FBI and during his testimony before the President's Commission. So basically... What he's saying there is the information concerning Oswald and Frazier at the rifle range was not mistaken. He may have been off on the date. Now, is it out of the realm of possibility, you know, to think that two young guys, one former military, both like to hunt, both owned rifles, both didn't drink, you know, not much to do in Texas. You know, shooting guns was a fun activity back then. Um, you know, and if you couldn't go off and hunt somewhere, you know, the rifle range is the next best uh, place. So is it out of the realm of possibility that these two guys 
would have done something fun like this together. And this is where you have to go put yourself in other people's shoes back in the time. You know, this is what I love to do when it comes to aspects of the assassinations is to go back and put yourself in somebody's shoes and ask yourself, what would I do or what would I have done if I was this person in this place at this time, knowing what I know now? And sometimes that can lead you to some very interesting propositions. Pretty much all of Frazier's and Oswald's co-workers at the School Book Depository seemed to think that Frazier was Oswald's only friend. By Frazier's own admission, in, C- in a CBS reenactment of his drive to Dallas from Irving that morning, he stated that it was raining and then he and Oswald only talked about the weather. Now, it's a 15 mile, <laughs> a 15 mile drive. Okay. And, and just one way. And to sit here and tell me that that's all you talked about is, is very hard to believe. Uh, now imagine yourself giving your friend a ride to work. Okay. It's raining outside. You both woke up late. You have to park a country mile away from the building you work at because somebody else had already taken your normal parking spot. Would you be nice and thoughtful and drop your friend off at the building so they wouldn't have to walk all that way in the rain? And if you want to see just how far the school book depository was away from where Frazier parked, please go to my article and see the picture. It's picture 39 from the Warren Commission, um, and it's very far. It's about a two-block hike from, you know, across the train yard, muddy, train tracks, yada, yada. It's raining. Uh, The above picture shows the very long distance Oswald would have had to walk with his package that morning, which, while a good scenario, can we prove it? Okay, I'd like to introduce everyone to Edward Shields, a Texas School Book Depository employee that worked at the State Building, which was another warehouse where all of the state books of Texas and Texas only were kept, and where Frazier parked his car that morning. And this is from an HSCA interview. Mr. D asks, how about Wesley? Shields says, Wesley Frazier, right? You're correct. Mr. D says, all right, he rode to work with him. Shields says, Wesley Frazier, yes, and they would park their car right on Houston Street and get out and walk to the building on Elm Street. Now, I want you folks to remember that line that I just read to you, and I'm going to read it again. They would park their car right on Houston Street and get out and walk to the building on Elm Street. Okay, keep that in your mind, because I'm going to bring it up later. Mr. D says, all right, the day of the assassination, did you see Oswald come to work with Frazier? Shield says, no, I didn't. They told me that he let him out at the building. He did not come on the parking lot. Mr. M says, you say they told you? Shield says, yeah. Mr. D says, who told you they? Mr. Shield says, "Uh, Junior Jarman, them, and all the fellows that worked there at that building. Mr. D says, all right, this is just, uh, can you tell me a specific person that told you that? Shields says, yeah, I think Charles Givens hollered out there and asked Frazier, where was his rider? And he told him, I dropped him off at the building. Yeah, that was it. Mr. M says, you say he drove him to work. You used to see him in the parking lot. Mr. Shields says, yes, he come by that parking lot. Mr. M says, did he drive him to work every day that you can recall or on certain days? Shields says, if I'm not mistaken, I think he rode with Frazier every day that he worked there, if I could recall. Now, I want you to remember that line that I just read to you. Okay, I'm going to read it again because it's important. Um, If I'm not mistaken, I think he rode with Frazier every day that he worked there, if I could recall. Mr. M says, and earlier you said that you recall that Oswald had worked there for six weeks. 
Shields says, yeah, he worked there for six weeks from mid-October to uh, this November to the assassination. So we know that Shields has a pretty good memory. He's recalling this from, you know, 15 years prior when Oswald started and when he stopped working at the school book depository. Mr. D says, now let me back up a little bit. Are you telling me this fella said that somebody who worked in the book depository, the building down on Elm Houston, hollered out the window and asked Frazier, where was his rider? Shields says, "Mm mm-hmm. Mr. D, are you talking about the morning of the assassination? Shields says, I think it was, Mr. Davis, if I'm not mistaken. I think it was. Mr. D says, now how did you come about this information? Mr. Shields says, well, I was down on the floor when they hollered out and said the answer he gave him. I don't know. I think he said I dropped him off at the building. Now, who, whoever it was hollering asked him, I don't know. Mr. D says, this is the morning of the assassination. Shields says, mm-hmm. Mr. D, somebody hollered out the window at Frazier and says, where is your rider? And to your recollection, Frazier says, I dropped him off at the building. Yes. And if you want to see in black and white with your own eyes, the transcripts of Mr. Edward Shields' interview with HSCA, again, head to the website, 22 November Network, all one word, dot wordpress dot com. Search for the article, and you can see it with your own two eyes, in black and white. Now, not only do we get the bombshell that Frazier dropped his rider off at the building that morning, we also get the very inter- interesting nugget that nice guy Buell Frazier drove Oswald to work every day. Which makes sense if you're wondering where the bus driver and fellow commuters are that rode with the president's assassin every day for six weeks are, you haven't heard from them because they don't exist. And the Warren Commission, you know, went out of their way to interview just about everybody that ever had any kind of contact with Lee Oswald in his entire life. So for them to establish how he got to and from work and to speak to the bus driver and fellow passengers that rode with him every day for six weeks and home to and from, it would have been done, but it wasn't done because it didn't happen. Because what if nice guy Buell Frazier gave Oswald a ride to and from work every day? And for the naysayers who claim it would have been too far out of Frazier's way to pick him up, and take him to his rooming house. It was only about one and a half miles out of his way to and from potentially only adding hey, fingerprint me. Sorry. Possibly only adding five minutes to his commute. A quote I found I just checked a map and I see that Irving Boulevard goes all the way from Irving into downtown Dallas. And it's only a a one-mile side trip down the R.L. Thornton Expressway and a half-mile to the rooming house or nearby rendezvous point. No real stretch to consider that Frazier might have given Oswald a ride to work every day. You know, and once again, you need to put yourself in somebody's shoes. You know, if you're a decent human being... um. And, you know, a fella that you had gotten a job at the same place you're working at was kind of down on his luck. He was going through some problems with his wife, uh, you know, to where to the, to the point where he wasn't living together with her. Um, and you uh, and you had a car and you had the means and it wasn't really too far out of your way. I mean, we're talking five minutes. You know, would you offer to give this guy a ride to work every day? I mean, I probably would. You know, it's not out of the realm of possibility. If Frazier is is the nice guy that everybody thinks that he is, why wouldn't he offer to do that? You know, it makes sense. It makes sense. Now, if that's all we had, that's a bombshell. That'd be great. 
that just means that Frazier hasn't been telling us the entire truth all these years. And then he may have known Lee Oswald a whole lot better than what he's been letting on. But that's not all we have. Now, let's see what co-worker Junior Jarman had to say about Frazier and Oswald to the HSCA. WB says, during the time that he was working there, did you ever see him show any type of animosity towards anybody? Jarman says, no, he was just an average fellow to me. AM says, did you associate with any particular person there? Junior Jarman, no one, but I uh, can't think of the dude's name. The one that brings brought him to work all the time. I'm sorry, what? The one that brings brought him to work all the time. AM says, a fellow that worked with him? Jarman says, yeah. WB says, well, let me ask you one thing. You said you saw him sometime between 8 and 8.30 that morning for the first time. Jarman says, Wesley? No. I don't even think he's here now. AM, did they come to work there together? Jarman says, yes. He always brought Oswald to work. I'm sorry. Hold on. Back up. Rewind. Jarman says, yes, he always brought Oswald to work. AM says, and after that, you didn't see him anymore until you saw him on TV. Jarman says, right. WB says, well, how about the fellow that worked with Oswald, the guy you said usually brought him to work? Did you see him the next day? Jarman says, well, I saw him the same day. So, <laughs> brought him to work all the time, and he always brought Oswald to work. Straight out of Jarman's mouth. That certainly is interesting, as Jarman was the order checker for both Oswald and Fraser, and had multiple contacts with both on a daily basis. Now, if that was all we had, <laughs> that'd be amazing, right? We have two eyewitnesses, co-workers, people that were there, people that would know, who say... That Frazier brought Oswald to work all the time, every day. Only friend there. But that's not all we have. Now, let's see what another co-worker named Harold Norman says. Day, who was Oswald's best friend in the building that you would think of? Norman says, I don't know of him having one. No, I don't. Day says, well, did you know the man Oswald came to work with? Norman says, yes. Day says, what was his name? Frazier, says Norman. Maxwell says, Wes Frazier, the guy that drove Oswald to work, was he friendly with everybody in the place? Norman says, yeah, I think Wesley got along pretty well with everybody in the place. Maxwell says, and of all the people in the place, about the only one you think that he was friendly with with Oswald was Wes. Norman says, well, I would say, I guess, because he rode to work with him. I don't know how many times he rode to work with him. Okay. Okay. So there we have another one. And, you know, if three of Oswald's co-workers say the same thing, you can't just dismiss it, okay? But that's not all we have. I have a special treat for you, and you're going to hear it from the man's mouth, verbalized in speech, another fellow co-worker named Roy Lewis. So there you have it, straight from the horse's mouth, a fellow co-worker, an order filler, who knew both men, say that Frazier would give Oswald a ride 
Frazier would give Oswald a ride to work every day. And another interesting piece of that that I told you to remember from the Shields interview is that Roy Lewis says that they they used to park on Houston Street where, where it curved right there behind the school expository. That's where they mainly parked and went in the back entrance, the Houston Street entrance, the back door there by the by the loading dock. So there you have it. Not one, not two, not three, but four co-workers, eyewitnesses, people that knew both men, telling you, telling the world, okay, that Oswald and Frazier rode to work together every day, every day. And at the very beginning of that, Roy Lewis was saying that he thinks that Frazier dropped Oswald off at the back door that morning but he didn't see it but that's what he heard so once again the scuttlebutt that was going around among the co-workers as you heard from Shields and Jarman and Givens etc uh, seemed to get bandied about back then but it wasn't made a big deal of and of course when the Warren Commission interviewed these co-workers none of this came out none of this was brought up and none of it came out and none of it was in any kind of written statements or affidavits from the day from any of the co-workers until they were asked the right questions by the HSCA investigators. Imagine that. But why is it important? It's important because it establishes and brings a more discerning light onto what Fraser has been telling us for the past 56 years. He's been telling us a story, the same story. But here we have his co-workers telling a very much different story. So you have to ask yourself, why, why, oh, why would Frazier lie about bringing Oswald to work all the time? Because it would imply that he and Oswald had a much more friendly relationship than what he has let on. And I understand it. Okay. I'm not defaming the man for it. I would have probably done the same thing had I been in his 19 year old shoes and being asked to sign a confession to be, to being an accomplice to the murder of the president. You know, I would have definitely wanted to distance myself as much as possible from the suspect. You know, what y'all talk about? Nothing. He never said nothing about nothing, and I don't know nothing, and that's it. I just gave him a ride to Irving when he needed it, and that's it. That's all I know. I worked with him. We didn't really talk much. He was all business. Uh, you know, I would have done the same thing, you know. You know, if it were to come out that, that they were much better friends, he could have definitely have been associated with him. Uh, he would have definitely been pulled into this thing. And I don't blame the man. But to get to the truth of what happened that day, we need the truth from Bill Wesley Frazier. And the truth seems to be something that the man has trouble doing. Now, after the Warren Commission, I believe Frazier uh, worked for a little while longer at the School Book Depository before eventually joining the Army in the mid-60s. And uh, he didn't make it that Vietnam, though. He managed to stay stateside for his entire military career, uh, even up until the late 70s. Buell Frazier did not make things easy for HSC inv HSCA investigators to talk to him. He would repeatedly change the date and location for the interview until finally acquiescing. According to John Armstrong in Harvey and Lee, page 880, when HSC and HSCA investigators tried to interview Frazier in 1977, he stalled repeatedly. The interviewer who was attempting to interview him wrote, Frazier continues to procrastinate, now wants to meet in lawyer's office next Friday. Definite resistance, but reason not apparent. 
We'll require another call tomorrow at 10 to see if lawyer says it's okay. 10 Call Buell Wesley Fraser at work and get more put off. So you see, Frazier wasn't really thrilled about having to talk to the HSCA. But he finally did. He finally did. And back to the article. Uh, it says, I'm reluctant to post any of Frazier's transcribed HSCA interview here, as out of four tapes found in the archives, two were completely useless, and the other two translate very nonsensical and unreadable and make very little comprehensible sense. The note here from Gilbride, please note the tapes one and two were too poor quality to transcribe. Whilst tapes three and four have been transcribed, they too were not of good quality. And it should be assumed that some errors have occurred as a result of that deficiency. Now, the reason I say that is to say this. One very particular piece of Frazier's HSCA interview is he told police, or he, he told the investigators of the HSCA that he was put in a police lineup with Oswald. Okay? And that Oswald remarked to him that he owned Dallas and that he said, you drove the car. <laughs> okay? So, that's interesting because in all of the official documentation of Oswald in custody. We never have seen or heard anything about him being in a in a lineup with Frazier. Also, is what I would say has to be the most interesting nugget out of this HSCA uh, interview, hands down. It's jumped off the page and leaped into my eyeballs when I saw it. Frazier says, no, I didn't know that he'd been caught, but I will tell you this. I knew that he hid the rifle. Uh, excuse me, what? Now, remember what I told you about these transcribed interviews. Um, some can be interpreted a little different. Um, for instance, you know, when it says, I knew that he hid the rifle, that could have been, I knew that he had the rifle. Okay. Either way, not good. Not good. Again, let me read that again. No, Frazier says, I didn't know that he'd been caught, but I will tell you this. I knew that he hid, had the rifle. Moriarty says, mm-hmm. And then Frazier says, he did. And I said to myself, I said, oh, my God, that was the first thing right there on the steps. I also knew that I didn't want to get pulled in. Um, excuse me, back up. What did you just say, Frazier? Okay. Now, this may be the first instance where Frazier has actually told the truth. Imagine that bombshell. If Frazier knew that Oswald had or hid the rifle, and that right after the assassination, Frazier's standing on the front steps of the school book depository with his arms crossed, staring into space, thinking, Oh my God. I don't want to get pulled into this. That, folks, is what we call bombshell worthy. Okay? Bombshell worthy. According to the book, No More Silence, page 342, Wesley said to me, talking to uh, Gus Rose, the det detective Gus Rose, Wesley said to me, I didn't think it was curtain rods, but I didn't want to argue with him. When we got to work, Lee got that package out, and I asked him, why don't we lock that thing under the trunk, and when we get off, you can get it? Oswald replied, no, I need it here. <laughs> okay? Now, 
I'm not a hunter. Okay. And I don't claim to be. But my uncle is a hunter. My cousin is a hunter, very avid hunter. My grandfather was a hunter. And I grew up going to their house, seeing the guns and gun cases and gun cabinets. Hanging on the walls in various states, gun bags, plastic cases, leather cases, cloth cases. And I can tell you, as Frazier was a rifle owner, he damn well knew what a rifle in a bag looked like. And there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Whether it was in a plastic hard shell case, whether it was in a leather case, a cloth case, or a paper bag. Hunters for sure, rifle owners for sure, people that have grown up around them for sure, know what is in that bag. Just by the dimensions and the way somebody would handle it and carry it and move it. End of discussion. So, if Oswald brought a rifle to work that day, Buell Frazier knew it. And this is not to say that Buell Frazier was in cahoots with Oswald to shoot the president. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is Oswald could have told him anything. This would not have been the first instance of people bringing rifles into the school book depository. As a matter of fact, the day before the assassination, there was a fellow that brought by two rifles to show to, to Superintendent Roy Truly, right there on the first floor for everybody to see, co-workers included, Oswald included. Okay, he could have just told Wesley, hey, man, I'm bringing my gun in to show so-and-so or I'm bringing my gun in to sell to so-and-so or, you know, I want to go shooting after work or I need to take it to the shop to get fixed and get sighted in. He could have told Frazier anything. But you cannot tell me that Frazier, if there was a rifle in the bag, did not know that there was a rifle in the bag because the only bag found in the school book depository was approximately 38 to 40 inches long and could have easily held a man like your Carcano. Which accounts for his quote to the HSCA saying, I knew he hid or he had the rifle. And just because I'm saying to you folks, that Oswald brought a gun into the school book depository. That does not necessarily mean that he was on the sixth floor shooting it at the time of the assassination. It's not what I'm saying at all. He could have, because if you will remember what I told you in the past episodes here on the Midnight Rider News Show, that rifle, that Manly Carcano rifle, was not registered to Lee Oswald. It was registered to A.J. Heidel. It was ordered in the name of A.J. Heidel. Okay. Who was in the New Orleans chapter of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. And A.J. Heidel was the president. Meaning that A.J. Heidel was a vehement supporter of Fidel Castro and in turn communism. Now, think to yourself for a second. Had John F. Kennedy not been shot and killed that day, but he had only been shot at. Just enough to scare the bejesus out of him. By a supposed... Castro supporter, commie lover named A.J. Heidel, this phantom menace 
would that have been the tipping point for him to finally do something about these damn communists 60 miles off of our shore that he had been so reluctant to do anything about in the past? Would it have been enough for him to say, all right, that's it, Mr. Soviet Union. I've had enough of your communist games and trying diplomacy. It's on. It's something to think about, for sure. Okay? Something to think about, for sure. And would Oswald have been smart enough to figure that had this rifle been found and tracked back to A.J. Heidel, was he smart enough to think that it would not be tracked back to him? Was he aware of the far reaches of what the FBI could actually investigate and do and determine? You know, would he have been aware that they could have determined where the gun came from, A, where it was shipped to, his post office box? Um, you know, would he have been that smart to figure that out? to figure out that the FBI could have figured figure that out? Or could he have been part of a plot designed to scare JFK into doing something about Cuba and the communists that he had been so reluctant to do in the past, but in fact went horribly wrong and either the shots that were supposed to miss hit or... It was a lie to Oswald the whole time, and he was set up as the patsy, just like he said he was. And that the real shots came from either the grassy knoll, or the Dow Tex, Tex building, or, you know, wherever they came from. But there you go. The gun is planted in the warehouse. Oswald works in the warehouse. They track it back to Oswald despite the fake name. And he is held up as the perpetrator. They got their man. Whatever the case, it's a very interesting supposition to think about. Now, another interesting thing to point to Frazier not being entirely honest. There was a book that came out in 1975 called The Assassination Tapes, of which I have a copy and have read. And what this book does is it takes statements from people associated with the Kennedy assassination and analyzes them against a voice stress analysis tool or an early kind of computer or polygraph instrument where instead of taking the vital signs of your body, uh, it analyzes voice stress. And people can argue all day whether or not it's better or worse than a polygraph, yada, yada, yada. From what it seems to me, uh, it's actually a little bit better and, and a little bit scary. So, And the technology, you know, has pretty much been uh, put out to use or put out of use due to the fact that people just don't don't like the fact that, you know, your voice can be analyzed and it can be determined whether or not you're lying. Uh, that's a scary proposition for people because it can be done without your consent. Um, so it never really became mainstream. And polygraphs aren't even admissible in court. It just basically is a tool for the police to use to steer their investigation. But in this book, like I said, various people and their statements you know, their oral on video statements were analyzed. And, of course, they analyzed the whole re reenactment of Bill Frazier on the CBS News of, you know, him taking Oswald to work and this and that and him telling his story. And you can see right there in black and white that he is being very deceptive at certain times in the story. He's lying about something. Um now, what it can tell you is, you know, it's, it can't tell you exactly 
what he's lying about. It's just that he is not being truthful. Um, in much the same way a polygraph does. Mm, excuse me. And in fact, in the assassination tapes book, nothing, no one, I guess, set off as many alarm bells as Buell Frazier. So in order to follow up and test more of his theory, uh, the author, Georgia O'Toole, called, called Wesley Frazier and pretended to be a news reporter and asked him some questions, nothing too over the top or to make Wesley suspicious of anything, but just some vague questions and analyze his statements. And they were determined to not be truthful as well. In addition to that, O'Toole had a special investigator, a private investigator out of Chicago, track Frazier down and interview him. And he recorded his interview and he determined using the, the PSE machine that Frazier was lying. Independently, he sent his interview with Frazier to the author who analyzed it on his PSE machine. And he came to the same conclusion that Frazier was lying. So, you know, it's just more corroboration that Frazier has not been telling the truth all these years. Which brings us to a pretty amazing nugget that I found. Because it got me thinking that Buell Frazier, after he was arrested and brought back to, to, to homicide, um, is that he was given a lie detector test the night of the assassination. So I went looking for it in the National Archives. And I thought I found it. I just went to the National Archives catalog and I input the name Wesley Buell Frazier. And up pops a file that just says polygraph. It says Frazier Buell Wesley Polygraph. And this is at re HTTPS dot backslash backslash research dot archives dot gov. Okay. And the National Archives identifier for this file is 836101. The creator was the ARRB. That's the Assassination Records Review Board. 102692 to 93098. From the series of files of Thomas E. Samaluk, CA 2194 to 7198. Level of description, it's a file. Type of archival materials, it's textual records. The creator compiled or maintained the series between 2194 and 7198. But there's an access restriction. And it's restricted possibly. Specific access restriction, JF, JF, John F. Kennedy Assassination Records Collection Act. Note, some materials may have been withdrawn for reasons of personal privacy or national security. Hmm. Personal privacy or national security. So at the time that I found this file, this is when, this is before, you know, we got all these file releases and everything. Well, about a year or two ago, my buddy Bart Camp, once again, comes through and requests this particular file from the National Archives. And he got a file containing some, I believe it was 37 or 38 pages. You could probably find the entire file uploaded to prayer-man.com. Just search for Fraser Polygraph. Um... That's Bart's website, and it contains a plethora of amazing information, and I encourage all of you to check it out. But what the file contained was not the results of Frazier's polygraph test, but instead a very confusing paper trail from lawyers of the Warren Commission to investigators of the HSCA trying to locate said polygraph results. And it was determined that they had probably still been retained by the Dallas Police Department 
and lost to history somewhere. Which is not good for us. Because it might have been an indication of whether or not Frazier was lying even back then. Because there was a reason. There was a reason that Fritz marched into the interview room and slapped a confession down in front of Frazier and asked him to sign it. And it wasn't just on a whim. Okay, people? As much as Frazier wants you to believe that. And, you know, I mean, he, he tells a story, you know, uh, on his sixth floor oral history about, you know, homicide chief Will Fritz coming in there and slapping down this confession and asked him to sign it. And he told him he wasn't going to sign it. And Fritz got angry with him and threatened to hit him. And Frazier said he told him, look, you hit me. You're going to have a one heck of a tornado on your hands in here. To which Fritz snapped up the paper and walked out of the room pissed. You know, but Frazier is the only one that we have this story from. We don't have the actual typed confession in the DPD files. We don't have the lie detector test results from the DPT files. We don't, obviously don't have any of the paperwork of a lineup that included Bill Wesley Frazier in the files or anything pointing to any of this. Okay, I think what we have here is a desperate police department. Desperate. Desperate. I mean, they had their guy for the murder of a cop, but they needed a little something more to pin the assassination on old Lee Oswald. And Frazier could give it to him. You know, he was the guy that drove him to work. He's the guy that could answer the only question that matters in this case. Did Oswald bring a rifle to work that morning? Period. End of discussion. That's the most important question that needs to be answered in this case. We can argue the semantics and, you know, the fringe aspects of this case until the end of time. Of the plotters and, 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 and the who's, the what's, the why's, the where's, and the, and the how's it's. But the most important question that they need answered back then was if Oswald shot the president, he had to bring a rifle to work. And you drove him to work, son. And you're the only one that can answer that question. Now, the problem and the dilemma in the head of Buell Wesley Frazier back then is, okay, well, if, if I tell him that I knew that Oswald had a gun and that he brought it to work and I didn't say anything to anybody and everybody knew that the president was coming by the building that day, that I could possibly be charged as an accomplice, even though I wasn't, it's a possibility that they could have charged him with that. Frazier knows this. He might have been 19, but he wasn't stupid. He wasn't worldly, as he likes to put it. But he wasn't dumb, either. What he did end up doing, however, is giving the police Oswald bringing a package into work that morning. But maybe in his mind, the big F you, buddy, is that the package was only two feet long. And it could not have possibly contained a rifle if it was only two feet long. But that's, that can be argued about in the halls of justice, in the courtroom, you know, yada, yada, yada. But, gee, somebody conveniently managed to shoot Oswald and kill him two days later in custody of the Dallas police. Interesting. So, until the end of time, these questions remain unanswered, unscrutinized, until now. And I'm telling you, folks, I've been looking into this case for almost 30 years. And this is, I believe, the most important aspect of this case the closest thing to ever getting us to the truth. And I think Frazier has a big secret to tell us. The question is, will he ever do it? Now, a little birdie, birdie told me a few years ago that Buell Frazier is writing a book. 
And when I heard that, I was like, oh, seriously? He's going to finally come and tell the truth. And then I heard who he's writing it with. And that would be a fellow by the name of Hugh Ainsworth, who has been a long time Dallas news media persona who was around even back during the assassination and who was a very avid proponent of the lone gunman theory and Oswald's guilt. But that might not be a bad thing if Frazier wants to come and tell the truth. The truth being, he knew Oswald brought a gun to work that day. But as I said before, you can't put the man on the sixth floor shooting that rifle. You just can't. So, will Fraser finally come through and tell what he knows before it's too late and lost to history? We can only hope. For more of the Midnight Rider News Show, head over to Midnight Rider News. Dot com. You can find the entire audio collection and past shows there posted for free, along with many interesting articles and links to the quarterly magazines who, that I urge you to subscribe to. There's very good information contained therein. Also, if you like what you hear, hear from me, Rob Clark of the Lone Gunman Podcast. I have over 150 shows all about the Kennedy assassination and various aspects of it. Feel free to find it, Google it. It's on iTunes, Stitcher, yada, yada, yada. Anywhere you can hear podcasts, you can find my show. Uh, check it out. Do a little digging. And enjoy. Until next time, folks. Rob is out.